has been an amazing uh, summer so far, and, and uh, I, I just, I've been enjoying this summer, cicadas and all. But uh, last week, last week uh, we had a, our reggae band here, and I can tell you what, it was so fun, and, and it was funny to me. A lot of people had a, a misconception and uh, a misconceived notion that as soon as you heard the word reggae band, that you weren't going to like it. And uh, I even had a couple people ask me, why in the world would you bring a group like that into Falmouth, Kentucky? And uh, I, I just, I'm sorry we can't afford Luke Bryan. Uh, <laughs> one of those groups from Georgia, what do they call them, Georgia, Florida line or something? Florida, Georgia. Florida, Georgia line. You know, <laughs> raise the tide. Maybe next year we'll, we'll afford one of those guys. But, uh, but anyway, for those that came last week, man, it was a blessing. And, and uh, people were leaving in tears. People were smiling ear to ear. Adam Betcher even said that if he, if he could dance, he was gonna, he would have danced. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was so cool to see. But uh, thank you guys for being so supportive and, and, and having an open heart. Not just, not just wanting to walk through the motions of, of church. Right? Not just going through the motions of church. You know, When I think about the motions of church, to be honest with you, it, it makes me sick to my stomach. Uh, the motions of church are, are fake. It's repetitive. It's boring. And it's the reason so many of our churches in our area are, are dying or are on life support. And uh, that's just not our church. Like I've been preaching from day one, when, as soon as you walk into this building, it's no longer about you. This church isn't about you. Right? We, we don't come here for you. We come here for God. And uh, that's, you know, so we didn't bring that reggae band in here for you. And that's a hard thing for a lot of people to swallow. Uh, but we didn't bring them in here for you. We brought them in for that kid that was going to be impacted, you know. Just like I was when Charles Johnson and the Revivers came to Fallon, Kentucky when I was a little kid. First time I ever saw a black musician. First time I ever saw a big old band with all black people. First time I ever saw people jumping around and singing about Jesus. Transform my entire life. I said, I want what they have. I want what they have. And, and uh, I, I'll tell you what, we may not ever hear about it, but one day these kids are going to be talking about the day that they got to see Christ the Far Eye in person here in Falmouth, Kentucky. So there you go. But listen, this week uh, I want to thank you guys also because we had another wonderful, wonderful serve week. And uh, I'm telling you what, seeing all the posts and hearing all the stories, it's just so awesome to be able to see the, all the impact that we've been having through this uh, Serve Week. And, and I love Serve Week because Serve Week is when Abram Crozier gets the most emails and messages from people outside the church. Uh, yeah. uh, I always do. And it's usually not positive. They, I, I always get the messages. They go, why do you always brag about everything that y'all are doing over there at Trinity? And uh, it just blows my mind every time, every time. Why are y'all bragging? Well, number one, I'm going to boast about what God's doing. Amen. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to brag about Jesus a little bit. I think sometimes uh, he deserves us to brag about, you know. That's something that we should do. Number two, uh, <laughs> here's, here's the other thing. Why in the world would I want to keep Jesus a secret? Why would I want to keep what Jesus is doing uh, as a secret? Why would we want to sit there and, and bottle up what we're doing as a church and just keep Amongst ourselves, we can pat each other on the back and say, hey, we're, like, the, the, the last week, uh, Mark Moore, the lead singer of Christ of Far Eye, he, he was talking about uh, how the world has control over everything. The world has control over social media. The world has control over the news media. They have control over Hollywood, our schools, our community. They even have control over the month of the year. And the reason that no one is hearing about Christ is because we're too afraid to tell people about it because we're afraid people are going to think we're bragging. Well, I'm going to brag a little bit about Jesus Christ. And I'm going to say this. Nobody gets to heaven through good works. But nobody, has, nobody gets kicked out of heaven for good works either. You know what I'm saying? Nobody gets kicked, gets kicked out. We, we get to heaven through Christ and Christ alone. And how in the world will people hear about Jesus Christ if we bottle them up and keep them to ourselves? Right? If you want to keep Jesus a secret, we are, we are the wrong church for him. Right? We're the wrong. Now, if you want to sit there and share about what Jesus is doing in your life, then we are the correct church. But I'm going to tell you this. Don't get too comfortable in your pews because we have a lot of work to do. Okay? So if you have your Bible with you this morning, turn with me to Philippians chapter 3, 17 through 21. Philippians chapter 3, 17 through 21. We're, we're doing a two-week series called uh, Shame Erasure. As a pastor, one of the things that I notice every single week is people coming to the church and, and uh, walking to the building 
is so many people are carrying the weight of shame. And uh, I don't care how well you put on a face or a persona about how everything is going great in your life or how perfect your life is. The reality is you struggle with the guilt of your past. And you, you struggle with the shame of your past. And, and the guilt of something that's going on right now. The shame that certain people know the real story. And you pray that nobody else finds out. And my prayer today is very simple. If that's you this morning, then I promise you this message is 100% for you. I put it, this message in a, in, a, in a gift wrap box and I put a little bow on top of it and I'm literally going to give it to you And uh, because here's the thing, I want you to receive this message and be free from the guilt of shame. I've literally, I've literally uh, I mean, this is something I've been praying about for weeks because we serve a Savior who didn't come to this world to condemn the world, John 3, 17, right? We, we all memorize John 3, 16. We forget about John 3, 17. Jesus didn't come to condemn the world. He came to do what, church? Save it. Save it. He came to save us. And uh, he can save you. He can erase that shame that's, that you're living with right now as long as you surrender it to him. You know, me and Becky went to go visit uh, Andrew and Brittany at their new house. They got a new house. And so we went to go visit them a couple weeks ago and see their new house. And, and uh, I, always, I always try to have some wisdom in my back pocket to give the younger generation. You know what I'm saying? Because I've lived life. Uh, I'm 32, <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> I've been around the block a few times, you know. And I've been home, I've been a well, well, I've probably been a homeowner for about nine years. And so I know I know some tricks. And so anyway, I want to go tell them, I want to go tell them one of the tricks because listen, when I got when I got our first house, I was so proud. New house, new yard, new lawnmower for my new yard at my new house. <laughs> and uh, I was pumped. The previous owner literally had mowed for like weeks and weeks. So it was like a jungle. And I said, I'm going to tackle it. I'm going to make it look so, so beautiful that all my neighbors are going to be envious of how wonderful my yard is. And uh, one thing that nobody taught me, and I was trying to tell Andrew and Brittany so they would not make the same mistake, is uh, bunnies make holes in the ground and have babies. And they put the babies in that hole. Do you all know this? I did not know this. Nobody told me. And so anyway, I had headphones on. I'm, I'm mowing. I'm having a good old day. I'm mowing my yard. Sure enough, that on those uh, bunnies just start jumping out of this hole. But by the time I got over the hole, it was too late. They literally jumped right into my mower. So you're talking about blood, body parts, spitting out. Now I'm not trying to get TV for you, but this is the reality of life. I didn't know any better. I didn't set out to kill bunnies. It was the worst experience of my life. I was traumatized. And you know what was worse? I literally, I went to the house and I said, I ain't mowing anymore. I'm done. Because... I could have swore that every single one of my new neighbors saw what just happened. You know? And I'm, I'm like, great, they're going to start calling me the bunny killer. You know? Hey, did you hear about the new neighbors that come? They, they're bunny killers. It was awful. I walked around with shame. I couldn't even leave my house for like a week. It was embarrassing. And I still get it every once in a while while I'm on. I still get flashbacks. But uh, uh, it was an awful, it was an awful experience. Check your yards, people. Uh, <laughs> but here's the thing, because uh, like you want to talk about shame, that was a shameful moment in my life, you know. And and uh, listen, I asked God to forgive me for those bunnies, and uh, you know I know He did, but I just couldn't wrap my head around the fact that every single one of my neighbors saw it, and and, and they, they they were immediately judging me, and uh, it just felt so awful. And for years, I, I just it was just a struggle. But but here's the thing. Well, it was an honest thing. God forgive me. But here's the thing. This is what, this is what the devil does when it comes to shame. He, he, he makes you feel like every single person is looking at you or knows your secret or, or whatever the case. And what I found out later is there wasn't a single neighbor, unless they're not telling me. I, I'm not a single neighbor that even saw it. So I don't even know what I was all worried about in the first place. So anyway, let's, we're going to be talking about shame today. So let's all stand up for the reading of this holy word. Philippians chapter 3, 17 through 21. Philippians chapter 3, 17 through 21. Brethren, join in following my example, and observe those who walk according to the pattern that you have in us. For many walk of whom I often told you, and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, where God is their appetite, and whose uh, glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ who will transform the body of our humble state into the conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to 
the subject all things to himself. May God bless the reading of his holy word. You may be seated. You may be seated. One of the things that we have to understand about shame and guilt is that if we aren't careful, the devil will use those things as a tool to tear us down. Right? Because when you're living with, with shame in your life, it keeps you in a state of depression. It gives you anxiety. It tells you that you're not good enough. It shouts at you that you aren't worthy. It puts a little voice in the back of your head that says, everybody knows what you've done. Everybody knows what you've done. Growing up, there used to be this uh, huge, scary movie that was real popular. I mean, it was everybody it was all over the place, you know. And it was called, uh, I Know What You Did Last Summer. You ever see that? Yeah. Good, you shouldn't have. All right. I was testing your Christianity out. Okay. Uh, well, here's the premise of the movie. And this isn't my theme. Murder is not my theme of the night or of the day, so I apologize. But here's the theme of this, of this movie. Literally, these kids hit a guy, kill him. <laughs> it was like 4th of July weekend. They put his body in the sea. They feel guilty and shame about it. I would assume we would. And they don't tell anybody. The next summer, there's a, a stalker, a killer, who literally wants to kill all of them. And you know what he does to torment them? He calls them, sends them emails, phone calls, all that stuff. And he keeps saying the same message. I know what you did last summer. I know what you did last summer. Then the rest of the, of the movie is pretty much like uh, the game of Clue, trying to figure out who the killer was. But this is exactly what the devil tries to do to us. He uses sin that we have done in the past. He uses mistakes that we have made. He uses instances in our life that we are embarrassed by. And then he literally constantly throws it into our face. And so Paul is writing to this church in Philippi, and he tells them to follow his example. And do you know what the example of Paul is? This is wonderful. If you look a few verses before this passage, verse uh, 13 in, here in, in chapter 3, Paul says, One thing that I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. What a great example. To forget what lies behind and look forward to what lies ahead. Paul's example is not being controlled by your past, not being controlled by your shame, and instead pressing forward to the goal. You know what Paul's goal was? Jesus Christ. His goal is Jesus Christ. Now, it's so funny because in our day and age, it seems like we have so many goals in this life. We're, we're trying to have all these goals in life. But Paul said, look, my goal is Jesus Christ. And that's what I'm going to go towards. Paul had a lot to be ashamed of. You know, know a little bit about him. He spent years chasing down early Christians to have them killed. He was prideful. He was a sinner. He even called himself the chief of sinners. But as a, his identity wasn't found in any of those things. His identity wasn't found in him being the, the guy that went to go kill all the other Christians. That wasn't his identity. Right? His identity wasn't found in him being a sinner. His identity was literally in Christ. Why? Because that was his end goal. Unlike so many people, even church people, right? We have so many church people who are walking so far away from Christ because of the shame that's happening in their life. You're walking so far away. You may come to church every Sunday, but you know that in your personal life, you have no relationship with Jesus Christ because you're ashamed of something. Right? And, and it's, it's, it's so heartbreaking because, listen, all God wants you to do is give him the shame. Give your shame over to him, and, and I'm, he will literally free you from it. Otherwise, that shame in your life will eventually kill you. It will eventually kill you. It will eat you up. And so the first question we have to ask ourselves as Christians is, what is our end? What is our end? That's our first point. Are we, are we like those who end in destruction, or are we like those who end in victory? I always say, if you can find out what somebody's end goal is, you can understand people so much better. Find out somebody's end goal, you will understand the reason they do everything. The reason they do everything, you know? Because if you look at, at Facebook, everybody posts for a reason. Did you know this? Every single body that posts on Facebook, there's a reason why they post. They either want to the, the show off to their ex that they're doing better than, you know, than when they were with them. You know, or, or they want to show their family that they, you know, that they, you know, what I'm doing is better. I don't. This, everybody has an end goal. They all do. And I, I pray that everybody in this church's end goal is God. When you post on Facebook, even though I know some of it's not. The other day I was, I was reading about. Uh, well, I'll, I'll be honest with you. Brad posted the other day, and it was said. It said about a time when somebody stole a wallet, his wallet, and his wife. I was so upset for Brad. I, and I didn't even read the whole thing because I skimmed it. So I'm like, who is it? And so I scroll down there to hit the see more button, and I'm trying to see more, see more, see what's helping. And then I'm like, it's not working. I'm trying to read the whole thing, what I can read. And it's like, I don't even want to say what it said, but it pretty much called me a dummy. <laughs> <laughs> I swear, that was not godlike. <laughs> I'm going to go fight with Brad. Point was, if you're a dummy, for it to see 
more budget than it was. It was awful. <laughs> <laughs> but who are you trying to impress in your life? What is the end for you, right? What's the end for you? Because here's the reality. If you're only searching for worldly things in your life, like, guess what? You'll get worldly things. You'll get worldly things. But here's the bad thing about worldly things. Nothing in this world lasts forever. Those poor bunnies didn't have a chance. <laughs> you know? This is nothing that'll last forever. They're going to die eventually. I said no. <laughs> oh, man. They're nothing will last forever. I'll say this too. Bridges, man. Hey, y'all ever cross a bridge? Yeah, y'all do it all the time. Y'all don't think twice about it. Every time y'all come to town, guess what? You're crossing over a bridge. And I don't know if you know this, but bridges don't last forever. And y'all cross over it like it's no big deal. These bridges are old. They're cracked. Some of them are falling. Y'all have no idea. And if you really look at the bridge, it's just a slab of concrete and some metal. There's nothing underneath it. I don't know how it stands up. And yet, we are okay with the bridge. Explain that to me. Doesn't make sense. I'll go even further. The bridge. <laughs> I hate bridges, man. They just don't make sense. These bridges were designed for a certain amount of weight, a certain amount of cars. This is back in the, when was that bridge built? 30s? Anybody lived that long? Christ, we all built that. They're 1930s. So here's my point. We have way more cars that are heavier with all this technology in them, and we act like it's no big deal. I promise you, these bridges aren't going to last forever. But yet, we have more faith in these dumb bridges than we do in our eternal God. Why is that? Why is it? It breaks my heart. And so here in verse 20, Paul tells us, he tells us this. He says, look, if you are a believer of Jesus Christ, if you are truly saved, then you have citizenship in heaven. You know how wonderful that is? And that, that citizenship isn't just temporary. It's not over when you die. Because in heaven you live forever. How amazing is that? Right? And so in order to have a, an eternal life, you have to be saved. How do you get saved? You have to have Christ in your heart. You have to have Christ in your life. The next question always comes to me, well, 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 what about baptism, April? Right? But you know, do we have to be baptized in order to be saved? No. You don't have to be baptized in order to be saved. I promise you, I didn't have to do anything special to this baptism on. It's family walk. Wouldn't recommend drinking it. <laughs> we, uh, uh, for three, four months ago, we did a baptism. The water was pink or purple or red.
And, and, and how relevant is this? We live in a culture and a society, right, where, where that's all that we do. Like, we celebrate sin. We celebrate our sinful lifestyles. We demand our country to not only embrace our sin, but make laws accepting our sin. And if you disagree with my sin, I will put you in the public square we call Facebook, and we will punish you. We'll cancel you. But we literally are watching the world worship their bodies. The world worship their lifestyles. The world worship their freedoms. We have people who are worshiping presidents. We have people who are worshiping guns. We have people who are worshiping alcohol and drugs. You're worshiping everything but the Savior. When you give your life over to God, you're no longer focusing your life on any of those things. Any of them. But you're supposed to be separating yourself from all the worldly things. Because our God is not our appetite. Just like it says in verse 20, we eagerly wait for a Savior. We eagerly wait. You know what the problem is with our churches nowadays? We don't eagerly wait for God anymore. You know what we do as, as Christians in our churches nowadays? We hatefully wait for the Lord. I can't tell you churches I've gone to where everybody's sitting there and they all got their arms crossed and they're all so upset. And I'm like, how can you be upset during standing on the promises? That's an exciting song, you know? But, you, but, but they're not eagerly waiting on the Lord, are they? They're hatefully waiting on the Lord. They're hatefully waiting on the Lord. It, it breaks my heart. I call it the spinach face. <laughs> you ever had spinach before? Woo! <laughs> the face you make. And you say, Abram, hey, you hate vegetables. How do you know? I don't know if spinach is a vegetable. Probably is. It tastes like one. It's disgusting. How do you know, Abram? Hey, but eat your vegetables if you're a child. When you get older, then you can do whatever. How do you know Abram what spinach tastes like? Well, I'll tell you. My, my, my dear sweet mom, I would always say, I'd watch Popeye the Sailor Man. Everybody watch that Popeye the Sailor Man. I love it. And I thought, man, look at his forearms. They were huge. I wanted that. I want those forearms. And I said, Mom, can you get me some spinach? My mom said, no way. You're not going to eat it. I said, yes, I will. She said, no, you won't. I said, yes, I will. No, you won't. So one day my Aunt Tony, my dear sweet Aunt Tony, she loved me to death. She loved me. I'm her favorite. Okay. I don't think my mom's favorite, but I'm my aunt's favorite, okay? Aunt Tony literally was watching me, my brothers, and I said, and she goes, we all for dinner. I said, Aunt Tony, can I please have spinach? I want big four. She said, of course you can have spinach, my sweet, you know, nephew, whatever I am to her. <laughs> so she goes to the store and she gets spinach. It even had Popeye on the can. <laughs> so I was so pumped and I, I tried to squeeze the can like Popeye does and let it squirt my mouth. It didn't work. So anyway, I said, I'm just going to scrap a whole handful of it. Like, ah, that's what Popeye does, you know? And uh, anyway, if you've had spinach, you know what face I made. The spinach face. It was nasty. It was so disgusting. And my aunt, being the sweet aunt she is, she said, you are not leaving this table until you eat all this food. <laughs> because I made a lot of money for it. I said, this thing only probably cost you 60 cents. Tastes awful. But anyway, I sat there until about, uh, I don't know, it's probably midnight. <laughs> so, but I survived, I survived. That's what, when, I, when I think of, of Christians nowadays who are hatefully waiting on the Lord, I think about that spinach thing. You know? Everybody's got that spinach face. But we're not supposed to hatefully wait for the Lord. We're supposed to eagerly wait for the Lord. You know, tomorrow me and Becky are going on our on a vacation. Boy, I'm excited. We don't get to go on vacation anymore. With, and let me tell you something. I'll be honest with you. When you're a parent, vacations aren't the same. You know, when you're a kid, you got to do whatever you want. You know, meals are fed, paid for, and then given to you. As an adult, you have a little bit more responsibility, okay? And uh, so vacations are hard, but we're going on vacation. And I'm so pumped. But here's the thing. Me and Becky did. Me and Becky have been around the block for a while with kids. And so we said to ourselves, no matter what, you cannot tell the children that we're going on vacation. <laughs> you know why? If you're a parent, you know why? Because they'll start asking every single hour of every day, when are we going on vacation? Are we going on vacation now? They'll pack their bags and they'll start walking around the house. Like, look, we got a month still. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> They do this stuff. And so we're like, we're going to wait till the last week before we tell them about uh, vacation. And we did. We waited till this week. And we told them. And guess what? Every single day, uh, I have to hear about a thousand questions about when we're going on vacation, where we're going on vacation, how long is it going to take to go on vacation. So pray for me tomorrow because uh, <laughs> I think it's a 10-hour drive. So that's going to be a lot of questions. <sighs> Just 
ask your mother. Just ask your mother. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, but that's what it means to eagerly wait on something. They're so excited that, that they just can't contain it. They get their bags ready and all that stuff. And how many Christians are doing that? How many Christians are excited to go into the church and praise God? How many Christians are packing their bags, getting ready for God to call them home? Or how many of us are sitting there wasting our, our, our life away because we're, we're ashamed of something or, or we're hatefully waiting on God? You know? And so what is your shame? This is our last point. What is your shame? What, what is it that's caused you to worry in your life? What is it that's caused you to feel guilty or feel worthless? What's happened in your life that makes you question if God would even take someone like you? A lot of times the things that we're most ashamed of or the things that we're most guilty of, you know, we just try to put them in a, in a box and lock them away in the back of our minds, praying that nobody brings it up, praying that nothing triggers it. We were never meant to carry that kind of burden. We were never meant to carry our shame. Like, and until we confess our shame and give it over to God, we will never experience the freedom that God wants us to have. I don't know if you guys know the history of writing utensils or writing instruments, but there was a time where people literally could only write in ink. You know, they had to dip it in the ink, they had to write it on the thing. And so you know what happens when you write an ink? You cannot erase it. All right? And so some genius, some, some real smart guy comes up with, this is in the 1600s, comes up with this graphite thing, and he puts it in between two wooden, hollow wooden pieces of wood, and he, and he calls it a pencil. You know? Pretty genius, huh? But you know what? They hadn't invented the, the eraser yet. So it's pointless. Couldn't erase it. You made, you made a mistake. You couldn't, you couldn't fix it. You had to start all over. Now, here's the, here's the cool part. In the 1700s, this guy named Joseph Priestley, he literally created a vegetable gum, and he used it to remove pencil marks. What a genius this Joseph Priestley is. This is the same guy that discovered oxygen. Now, this is, this is my first thought when I read that. There was a time when human beings walked around going, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> Are you kidding me? So this guy was like, oh, we call that oxygen. Oh, great. So anyway, the oxygen, so this is fun fact for you. The oxygen guy also created the uh, eraser. Pretty impressive. In the 1800s, a guy named Charles Goodyear, you've probably heard of him, got a hold of it. He, 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 he uh, was able to cure the rubber so it would become more durable. And in Philadelphia in 1858, Hyman Littman, remember that guy's name, he created the pencil with an eraser attached. What a genius. You know? Uh, the pencil manufacturers don't even call it race. I think they call them plugs, but it, it just blows my mind. Could you imagine the feeling that you got when you first got a pencil with an eraser? How cool that must have felt? You know? I remember when we got a computer in my house for the first time. I thought, I thought literally some alien dropped it in our house. It was making all these alien sounds. <laughs> 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 So I'm like, this is the craziest thing I ever saw in my life. So imagine when you sit there and you've been having to, you know, not make a mistake in that respect. And they did cursive back in the day. These kids nowadays don't know cursive. They used to do cursive. Imagine making a mistake in cursive and you couldn't fix it, you know? You look like doctor's handwriting all the time. So anyway, uh, so I just, I couldn't imagine that feeling. But, 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 but let me blow your mind. Jesus Christ, when you receive him as your Lord and Savior, you know what he does in your life? He starts erasing that sin. Just like that eraser. He starts erasing that sin and shame. And he erases it immediately. So you don't have to live with it anymore. So you're not defined by who you are or what the world tells you you are. If you're a born again believer in Jesus Christ, it's no longer you who lives, but it is Christ who lives in me. There's nothing more sweeter than that. There's nothing more greater than that. It's the reason we should be eagerly waiting on the Lord because if someone who puts their faith in God, I know how it all is going to end. I'm thankful for that. One of the band members asked me, he was, he was talking to me about uh, the drummer. He was talking to me about uh, being in a reggae band, and I thought that was cool. I wanted to be in one. They never invited me, but uh, one day. <laughs> but he was saying it's so hard because as a Christian reggae band, re normal reggae bands don't want anything to do with them. They don't like their Christian belief. And they said, but then we go to churches, and churches want nothing to do with them because they're reggae. And he said he really struggled with this for, for uh, many years because he said he, said he felt so, so shameful. Because that, that, he was trying to get approval from these reggae groups. He's trying to get approval from the church. And neither one was giving him any approval. And he said one, one day he started to pray about it. And he said, I felt God tell me in my life that, that I wasn't here to, to get the approval of the world. I wasn't here to get the approval of the church. But I was here to serve God. Amen. He said, change my life forever. Change how I viewed everything. And so if you're here today and you're, you're guilty or ashamed or you're worried 
about what other people are thinking about, about you, or, or, or you're worried about how other people perceive you. Do not walk out of here believing that lie. Don't believe that lie that the devil's trying to put on you. Your approval does not lie with the world. Your approval does not lie with any likes you can get on Facebook. Your approval does not lie with the church. Because I'm telling you right now, the hypocrisy of our churches will destroy you. They'll make you feel so belittled inside of a church that you literally want nothing to do with Christ. Breaks my heart. Breaks my heart. But let me tell you something. Do not buy into that. Don't listen to it. Because you're not trying to seek the approval of man. But you, you need to be seeking the approval of God. Seek the approval of God. And then come to the altar, lay your burdens down, and let God break those barriers for you. As we come to a close in a time of invitation, I... I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're going to take about five minutes while the piano plays. If you have shame in your life that you're dealing with, just come to the altar and lay it down for God. Say, God, take it over. We'll have everybody's head bowed, every eyes closed. And, and we're just going to have just a few minutes with just the piano. And, and uh, just give it over to God. So let's, let's get everybody's head bowed, every eyes closed. Every head bowed, every eyes closed. You want to come to the altar? This is the time to do it. Say, God, I'm sorry. God, I can't get around the shame that I'm living with. Because when you give your life to God, one of the greatest things ever could happen to you. You become cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. You're no longer who you once were. Your identity is no longer what the world says it is. You become a child of God. So with every head bowed and your eyes closed, if you're ready to throw your shame away, make your way up to the altar.